Hi everyone, we're just getting started. Uh, would you mind um, indicating your names and the participants first? So for those of you who don't have it up. Okay, Andrew, over to you. Welcome everybody. My name is Andrew Kuhn. My pronouns are he, him. I'm the Vice President for Finance for Sakai. And I'd like to welcome everybody to what is our February monthly meeting, open meeting of Sakai, even though it's March. And before we start, I would like to briefly uh, take a look at the code of conduct. And I, I thank you, Stacy, for sharing the link. Uh, you can take a look uh, as far as uh, check-in presentation content that I did want to specifically spend a bit of time on the supportive space aspect of it. So let me quick read, technical issues, anxiety and glitches are expected. Uh, please be patient. Please show sensitivity to anyone speaking. Uh, be kind and supportive. People, people's lived experiences are not for debate. Uh, their ideas, policies, and suggestions, those are. And unfortunately, the lines between these two are not always clear. So please give one another the benefit of the doubt. And I fully feel this, that grace and sensitivity and validation go a long way towards uh, creating community, which is what we're attempting to do. So let me now briefly walk everybody through today's agenda. We will start out by talking about the fiscal year 2023 Sikai budget, which the executive committee uh, just voted on. We will then spend some time talking about uh, the um, events at CHI 2022, which are related to Sikai. We will have some time to talk about mentorship as well as uh, recruiting Sakai volunteers. And then at the end of our one hour meeting, we will have at least 10 minutes as an open mic. And one aspect, one thing that Neha Kumar, our president will be talking about there is how we can support our community uh, during this uh, time of, of war uh, on Ukraine. So with that, what I would like to do now is I'll share my screen and I will start out with the discussion of our fiscal year 2023 budget. And with any luck, you can see this. Is that true? Very good. Yes. Thank you. So before I start, I do want to acknowledge the fact that um, many in our community, probably everybody in our community is, is affected by the war on Ukraine. I want to acknowledge that there is pain related to this. Um, many people in our community are from Ukraine, are from Russia, uh, are from that region. And I think that throughout the world, people are looking at this tragedy and, and they're upset by this. And uh, I certainly personally am very upset by it. Um, and I'm glad that we're gonna have a, a chance to, to talk about this at the end of our one hour meeting and, and think about how we can support our community in these difficult times. So thinking about our budget, I, I always want to, to make sure that we have a, a clear picture of what the budget really means. So. There is one budget for the entire Sakai community. We're one community of 25 sponsored conferences. Um, we have a, a number of chapters throughout the world. There are countless volunteers, including many of you here today. Um, there is really a worldwide community. And ultimately there is a single budget um, that all of, the, all of these efforts are, are related to. So, with this in mind, I also wanted to point out the commitments that we have as, as SICKI. So first of all, transparency. We are committed to making sure that everybody in our community has a clear picture of finances and that's what we, we will get today. 
And then also thinking about how everybody can influence their influence these finances at the different levels of volunteering. We're committed to equity and from the perspective of finances, how finances can support this. And then we're also committed to financial health. And we have this as a common goal in order to enable all of these um, efforts above. I also want to point out that we will talk about specific numbers in the budget, but it's worth mentioning that the budget is a plan in contrast to a certainty. We've all experienced that great uncertainty over the last couple of years. So we know that what this is about. And ultimately what we're gonna talk about in a minute is adding and subtracting. What we have is revenues that are projected. So uh, we know where we stand right now in terms of looking at the, uh, you know, if you will, the bank account, right? If, if you want to look at it that way, but looking ahead to the next fiscal year, which starts July 1st of this year, we have projections. We can start thinking about what sort of revenues will come in. In fact, ACM does this for us. They start thinking about what sort of revenues we can expect, they project out. There are also, of course, expenditures. Some of those are, again, projections. For example, what will a particular conference do? What kind of expenses will they have? In addition to that, we also have a plan, and that's also what we're gonna to discuss today. What do we think we should spend on um, in, our, in our efforts to support the Sikai community? There's also some ACM rules. One specific one that I wanna point out is that there is a minimum balance requirement. Once everything is added and subtracted, the amount that is projected to be left in the Sikai account cannot be below 50% of our fiscal year expenditures. So if we plan to spend $100 next year, at the end of that year, we need to have at least $50 in the bank. And then again, I just mentioned this, the uh, ACM fiscal year starts July 1st. So all of the accounting at ACM starts July 1st and ends June 30th. Currently, we're in fiscal year 22. And on July 1st of this year, we are starting fiscal year 2023. So let me start out by looking at the revenues for fiscal year 2023. These are projections. These are projections that we received from the ACM. They based these uh, projections on past experience. We expect to have about $70,000 in membership revenue. The ACM Digital Library uh, brings in revenue to the ACM, and a part of that is sent over to SIGs, including SIGCHI, and that's going to be over $800,000 projected. And then sponsored conferences, of course, have revenue. These are the fees that we all pay. These are the sponsorships and so forth. And that's about $4.7 million. So all of this and some other small uh, uh, revenue totals about $5.7 million, which we expect to, will be the revenue in the next fiscal year. Now, here's what the uh, SICA Executive Committee voted on. In, in our time zone that will be today, in my time zone, I should say, on the East Coast of the United States, that would be today. So uh, I tried to break this up in, in a way that made sense to me. So first of all, there will be some uh, uh, expenses on sponsored conferences. These are actually mostly, these are projections again, right? So what do we expect sponsored conferences will spend? And we expect that to be roughly $4 million. The next item is again, back to our commitment of supporting our community. So grants, awards, and different sponsorships amount to roughly a million dollars in the budget. This is the largest amount as a group that we're spending because of course that it is about supporting our community. The next item is what we call professional support functions. And these are various ways that we basically get professional support from, uh, uh, from for example, executive events who support various uh, act activities of the executive committee, different, uh, different conferences and so forth um, to, to things that we need to do with our website and so forth. And this is $800,000. We have a number of 
exciting special projects. I'm not going to go into details here, but over the, uh, the coming weeks and months, you will find out more about these. And of course, um, the various people who serve on the executive committee are bringing wonderful ideas in specific ways that they think individually or in small groups, they can work to, to support the community. And that's what these special projects are. And that's around $380,000. We will also support volunteer travel. Um, this would be at around $230,000, as well as venues that some of these volunteer travels will have as a destination. So we're talking, for example, about meetings of a particular group of people who might discuss certain ways, again, to um, uh, in support of community activities. And they might, for example, be at, at, a, uh, uh, at a university where they rent out a room or maybe at a hotel or a venue like that. And that's about $90,000. Interactions Magazine. Um, is roughly $125,000 to produce and send out to our, our members. We will also support uh, Kite 2023. And I have to say, I have, a, have these numbers backwards. The Kite 2023 support is roughly $500,000. And then uh, ACM overhead is around 800. And so that adds up to a total of $7.9 million. Um, so where does that all bring us? The revenues, as you saw, are roughly 5.7 million. Our expenses are planned at around $7.9 million. So the fiscal year balance is about a, a $2.2 million uh, in the negative, which will leave our ending balance at about $4.1 million. So the projected value of Sikai's balance at the end of the fiscal year 2023, which is, uh, you know, uh, that, that's June uh, 2023 will be $4.1 million, which is above that required minimum ending balance, which I mentioned to you earlier, which is roughly 50, which is 50% of our expenses. So 50% of 7.9, right, is just under, uh, by, by about $200,000 under the 4.1 million. So um, that is the uh, budget and I will stop sharing now and slowly move uh, to the next item. Uh, people who might have questions, I didn't look if there are any questions, but those are welcome in the chat. And then also, of course, we will have uh, an opportunity at the open mic time as well. So um, the next item on our um, agenda is our discussion of uh, Sikai at Kai 22. And Neha, I believe you were going to start with that. Yeah, if there were no questions about the budget, which there aren't. So I guess we can, uh, we can talk about the uh, events at CHI. Um, so uh, we have the usual events, if, if you still remember uh, a few years ago, um, we have the town hall sessions. We're going to be doing hybrid as much as possible. So there will be um, uh, enough of a chance for people online to be participating as well as for people at the venue. So we have uh, two town hall sessions that, we'll, uh, that we've scheduled, or actually I don't know if, where they are on the schedule. Uh, we'll see the program soon enough. Uh, we have the, uh, um, the awards and we're yet to announce the awardees, but that should be soon. We are organizing a plenary panel, which is going to be about the history of Sikai and Kai, um, and that is uh, uh, Susan Dre's uh, charge. And then uh, we have on Sunday evening, uh, this uh, volunteer appreciation day, and that's also when we celebrate 
uh, 40 years of Sikai. So that's the Sikai Turns 40 event. And then um, I think perhaps most exciting are the three SIGs that we have planned. So there's one um, that is being led by Adriana uh, Vivacqua, who's our VP at large on hybrid events. So we're talking about hybrid conferences and events um, and having a discussion around that. Uh, there's another which is around equity talks. So if you remember, we've done a series of equity talks last year, which were these, uh, which then transitioned into the open sessions that we've been having uh, recently. But we wanted to come back to the topics that had been discussed in the equity talks and see what action had been taken in response to the issues raised then and what more we need to do. Um, and that's going to be led by Kael, uh, who's our um, uh, uh, chair for equity. And then uh, there's a third, which is about envisioning the future 40. So looking back, but using what we see when we look back to look forward. So that's the futuring um, uh, SIG that Susan Dre is going to be uh, uh, leading. So um, that's what we have planned. Um, we've been talking about other ways in which we can be there, maybe have listening booths, talk uh, to volunteers. Uh, there'll be a chapters event. So if you represent a chapter, then look out for information about that. Um, but that's uh, that's what we have on the calendar for now. Should we, uh, I don't think there's anything to ask questions about really. So should we move on to the next? So could you- So we're moving to mentorship and you'd like me to share? Yeah, yeah. So as you know, and as I just mentioned, we've uh, been doing these open sessions uh, roughly one a month to talk about issues and topics that people in the community care about and that uh, are brought up uh, from time to time. And one thing that we've been hearing a lot about is mentorship. Um, so uh, this past month uh, in February, we organized open sessions, uh, and again, two sessions mainly because we wanna be able to uh, cover different time zones. So last week on Monday and, and Friday, we had two open sessions on mentorship and uh, Kale also um, helped out with the, with the second one. And what I'll share now is just uh, the document that we had going that you can take a look at. It was the, the collaborative document where we just jotted down notes. Uh, we talked about different uh, ways to think about mentorship. And um, if you look at it, you'll see we discussed what good mentorship looks and feels like to get people thinking. What are some good mentorship programs that people have seen and experienced? Um, and so we had a bunch of examples there. We talked about mentorship needs across Sikai. Can you go back to the previous uh, slide? Previous slide. Thank you. Um, and, um, and then how might the EC address these needs for the community? And there were a bunch of ideas shared there. So we will try to um, uh, summarize these a little more concisely and share them uh, eventually. But these were good for us to think about um, when we were deciding on the budget. So our goal really, um, as I have on the side here, was to lower barriers that prevent us from gaining and sharing guidance that would enable our members to produce the best possible work for the best possible venues. Um, so thinking both about the research that is produced and also um, the conferences and how we support them. So uh, some of the things that came up were that we need to think about mentorship uh, across different ages. So it's not just for people who are early in their lives, but also later, uh, different career stages, different contexts, whether it's regional contexts or contexts in terms of whether they're researchers or practitioners, um, different time frames. So uh, you might be looking for mentorship that is just sort of a one-off session, but you might also be looking for longer uh, term relationships. And then also looking at different types of relationships. So uh, mentorship doesn't have to go in only one direction and there's different types of um, knowledges and experiences that we can learn from. And so how do we try to recognize all of those? So it's really um, about thinking of 
creating a culture around mentoring across Sikai. That's what we've been uh, thinking about. And so this is sort of a meta level project that we were um, thinking of when we, we were going through the budgeting exercise. And, um, uh, and the other thing I'd say is that it's not just about thinking about kind of focused mentorship sessions, but also thinking about um, the different activities that we have planned with the community and how um, we can also be mindful of the mentoring opportunities that those could offer. So if you go to the next slide now, thank you. So uh, there's some events that have been proposed to us actually for a couple of years now, because we've been waiting through COVID um, our, uh, the student design competition to try to bring together students from different parts of the world, uh, from the global north, from the global south, have them compete and ha have this be kind of a, a drawn out experience so that students get to engage um, uh, on an extended basis with, with others. Uh, there's a Sikai summit, which is essentially for people um, who are uh, our conference leaders and community leaders who um, are, you know, people who would be general chairs or subcommittee chairs or uh, other uh, conference chairs in our um, uh, uh, in our portfolio of 25 conferences and thinking about how we um, bring them together to be on uh, on the same page around some of their, uh, uh, you know, how they go about conferences and reviewing and, and talking about research and such. So that those are two proposals that uh, we've been wanting to um, see uh, uh, in the community. And we're hoping that in 2023, we'll be able to make that happen. And then, um, uh, there's mentoring workshops for early careers, uh, and I've written early careers, but they are really researchers uh, and practitioners, uh, early career professionals. And this is going to be led by um, Priya, who's our uh, EC for volunteer support, along with Shawen Bradzel. And Shawen is actually overseeing uh, mentorship and leadership initiatives in general, so, um, so across these uh, events. Then we're uh, looking to form a committee um, that's focused on uh, SIGCHI futures. And by futures, uh, um, we mean uh, students and early career uh, professionals in our community and how they can come together to work on projects um, that are about SIGCHI's future. So we'll start that discussion at the SIG at CHI this year. And we're hoping to form a committee after um, and see how how the projects um, help us figure out directions for, for SIGCHI to take in the future. And then there's various events around knowledge sharing and volunteer development across conferences, again, across stages and, uh, and ages, as I mentioned, um, that are also going to have um, a focus on mentoring, even if that isn't the primary focus. So that's what we've we've got planned um, under mentorship. Are there any questions that anyone has about any of these events or even any, any additional suggestions since there's a lot of new people who weren't, weren't there uh, last week? Okay. It seems like we're moving along pretty <laughs> quickly. We thought we had a bunch of things planned for today, but maybe maybe not quite so much. So so we can move on to the next item, which uh, um, Andrew is that um, recruitment. So um, we, we have uh, Sakai volunteers recruiting Sakai volunteers, and then open mic. Okay. So with the uh, with the next item, it's basically uh, you know to let you all know when we keep putting out this messaging uh, in our uh, on our email list and then social media. But basically, through through this year so far and over the next few months, uh, various uh, members on the EC are looking to form their committees to look at uh, new areas. Um, well, some new, some old uh, areas. So for instance. The sustainability committee had its call out, and the communications committee is going to have its call out pretty soon. Um, I already mentioned the futuring committee efforts, and these are all to basically generate opportunities for more people to get involved, for there to be some structure to these, to see how um, 
they can come together. And uh, I think uh, what I'd like to do now is just invite those members to say a little bit about what they're thinking, maybe one or two minutes just to say what, um, what type of the committee they're putting together and uh, just, just to say that we'll be putting out calls soon or that we already have a call out. So maybe I'll start with Nick because Nick, your call is still live, right? For the Sustainability Committee. It is, thank you. Hello, it's Nick Goodwell. It's um, alive till the 7th of March. Uh, oh, actually it stays alive, it's ongoing, but on the 7th of March, I will um, and uh, start to um, uh, start the uh, interview process um, with my colleagues um, to see how people fit in. Um, so they're working on 12 members of the committee. Um, to, um, and it looks quite, ho quite hopeful at the moment. Um, we do have some criteria so we are trying to make sure that all geographic regions are supported and there's great diversity in the committee. And I'm gonna just share your, uh, a link to your blog post for people to take a look at if they want. Uh, Tammy, would you like to go next? Sure, hi everyone. Um, so I am going to be um, uh, recruiting for the um, communications uh, committee. So the communications committee is responsible for all the day-to-day -day sort of um, communication with the larger SIG High membership. So all those emails that you receive, the social media um, posts that you see, um, all kinds of things like that. So there's the sort of day-to-day, -day, um, you know, uh, interactions of the committee, but then also um, we'll be launching two special projects for um, the community. So I'll be sharing more um, about that soon, but basically we want to really um, do what I call gathering the diverse voices of Sikai. And so reaching out to different communities within um, or different sub communities within the Sikai membership to um, understand more about how they find out information about Sikai and how we can better reach them and help them to become more aware of what the the um, SIGHI EC is, what we do, um, and how they can and figure out how we can get people more involved. Um, so, um, so we want to do that. And then also we want to um, develop some, uh, you know, resources and materials to help people learn more about the, um, the, the SIGHI uh, and SIGHI EC. Um, so that will be sort of the down the line special project that we'll be working on. Uh, so I'll be recruiting people who love social media, who love um, communicating, who um, love listening to people and synthesizing and all those kinds of things. Um, so please be on the lookout for that and consider um, joining. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, Susan. Hello, I'm Susan Dre. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. And um, I'm currently not available for viewing because I'm in my bedroom to get away from all the hubbub that's out in the other room with my elderly aunt with dementia. Okay, so I have two committees that are going to be coming online. The first committee, which will be soon, is uh, to help uh, create, make, support uh, the the um, whatever events we plan to do with Sikai turns 40. And we have several things in the works. We wanna make sure we include people again from different geographies, from different, uh, of different ages and stages, et cetera. We clearly need to have some um, of our senior folk, Ben, I'm thinking of you and others. And um, we also need to have people who are younger. So we will be, that call will be going out sometime during March, hopefully, hopefully very soon. Um, and uh, then my second one is for partnerships. I'm the AC of partnerships. That's my primary role, um, <clears throat> pardon me. And um, that will be going out probably after March, I don't know when. Uh, we are starting 
the, I have had a lot of contact with various people over the years in various organizations. And so one of the things that we as SIGCHI want to do is uh, find ways to, re- to interact with our sister organizations um, and to, to strengthen the field as a whole. So that group will also be diverse, as we've mentioned before, and we will also be focusing on where, what kinds of organizations we should be approaching, how we should be approaching them, how we make certain things happen. For instance, if we want to have reduced, mutually reduced fees at conferences, et cetera, and how we, how we actually make that work. So again, we're going to need a, a wide variety of people. I would imagine we'll probably have, I don't know, 10 or 12 on each of these committees, but that is currently uh, being discussed. So that is what's happening in my land. Thank you, Susan. Uh, is there anyone else who wants to say anything? We don't have anything out in writing yet for any of the other committees, but there will be soon, I guess, for volunteering or for equity. Uh, so we'll come back with that maybe next month. Um, anything else that we had on the agenda? Should we move on to the discussion? We can. I, I think we have a couple of questions. Uh, regarding the budget and specifically sustainability. So I would like to take a moment to address that. And let me reshare that screen. Um, so here's the, here's the, um, our, our plan. And first I did wanna uh, say that this is a large uh, planned um, set of expenses. And um, I, I would like to, to thank everybody who's you know on the executive committee because this was carefully thought out with um, a, a sequence of, of meetings that started, well, really at you know July 1st when when our, our term started. But um, it, it really intensified in January and then February. Um, I had a a host of meetings with with um, executive committee members uh, to discuss, you know, past budgets and and what might be possible and what you know, what uh, how how they might consider um, implementing the things that they thought about. People had small group meetings, and um, and um, you know, Neha was was uh, instrumental in, in helping us together formulate a. a a vision of how we're gonna support the community. And so the question is what, what to do if, if your budget looks reasonably good, which is Sikai's current status. Over the last year, uh, the, due to the work of the community, due to the fact that conferences were, were extremely uh, well organized, um, our expenses, or, or sorry, our, our, uh, our uh, our income would exceeded our expenses. So in fact, we will find ourselves, if, if all continues as, as it's going right now, in a better financial position at the end of this fiscal year than, than at the beginning of it. And so our feeling as an executive committee, as, as a team, was that after two years of, of um, great trials for the community, it is time to, to push and to help in various ways that we can. And so I want to point out that the the way that the money is allocated here, and by the way, I I fixed that CHI 23 budget and also the ACM overhead, which is about 390,000. So that the way that money is allocated is very uh, carefully done. It is in fact, as far as, you know, the one question is about sustainability. We did care a great deal about sustainability when it comes to, the sustainability of the earth. So for example, you'll see that we were careful in terms of how we think about travel, how we think about venues and how that in fact will be implemented in terms of where people go locally or, or, or do they take to the long distances. Is it sustainable to have um, losses year after year? Absolutely not. Um, clearly this isn't something that we, we keep doing year after year. Um, at the same time, 
as a team, we felt that this is a year when it makes sense to have a big push where we're going to support um, support our our, um, our volunteers, our community. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, Andrew, can I ask you what question you were answering? Thank you. Um, sustainability. Is this, uh, and, and Patrick, you have your hand up. Sure, yeah, I guess just to follow up on that, Andrew, I'm, I'm just thinking, as you, you know, obviously it's not sustainable to have a two million different flog in the medium term. I'm just thinking the elements of those budgets that are, you know, not fixed costs essentially, or not, I mean, fixed costs are a bit different, obviously, in, in this sense. Uh, they are, what, what would you identify? Then is that the the grant the one million on grants and awards or you know I'm just trying to think which bits of those correspond to that sort of deliberately increased expenditure this year because I guess they're the ones that would reduce in further years maybe um, depending on revenue and projections and anything it, it might be worth just indicating that you know because um, some of those things you've got no control of have you I guess like ACM expenditure and things like this. You're right. So. Uh... I think to some extent, right, there is there are conference revenues and expenses. And in fact, as a community, we do have control over it. And we've shown wonderful control over it over the last, well, all of the years, right? But certainly it, I'm, I'm sort of focusing on the last year where it's, where it's been quite amazing. People have gone through trials and tribulations where your conference is on, it's off, it's, it's virtual, it's hybrid, it's something. And, and, you know the flexibility that people have, our volunteers have have had, is is something that we should all be grateful for, and and I think that's how we need to look at the budget too. So everything that practically everything that's in the budget is in fact flexible. So there isn't anything that we have to spend on. For example, um, ACM overhead is charged by expense. So every you know dollar, it's it's, it's counted in dollars, right? Every dollar you spend, there is a formula and they charge. So in principle, if you spend zero, you would get zero overhead, right? So, so that is also uh, to, to some extent flexible. So I'm not aware of really, you know, obviously you don't have a SIG if you're not spending any money, but, but none of these things are commitments that we keep having to, to do. If that, I don't know, hopefully that answers your question. I guess I'm thinking, you know, really simple terms which are the major differences from last year's budget? Maybe that's the point, which would account for the rise in expenditure. You know, that, I guess that's what I meant, sorry. I'll have to say that um, I did look at the last normal budget more than I looked at last year's budget. And I can certainly look at last year's budget. The trouble is that last year's budget was not, you know, representative of what, is going to happen well we have no idea right but we weren't planning um so as a matter of fact uh, our, our rough estimate for, or our budgeted numbers for the last um pre-pandemic year were somewhat similar they weren't really all that far off um so you know for what it's worth um it is a it is a big budget and uh but it isn't sort of an unprecedented doubling of everything that we've ever done, you know. And um, by the way, I'm, I'm not trying, you know, I'm happy to, you know, if you'd, if you'd like, I'm happy to jump into the, the budget spreadsheet with you and, and take a look directly. So none of this is a secret, right? But it's, it's, it's roughly, um, you know, our last regular year, so to speak, was similar. And of course, the last couple of years were just odd. And that's, by the way, uh, I'm happy to, if anybody wants to look at the, you know, spreadsheet that none of this is a secret, happy to, happy to open it up with people, reach out, we can set up a meeting, uh, small groups, one-on-one, -on -one, whichever works, and I'm happy to look it through. Were there other questions about the budget? Andrew? I don't see any. But if anybody has any, um, otherwise we can go to open. Well, it is sort of open mic time. Oh, there's.
Should we, so we move on? Sorry, I, I was wondering if you just got something. I, I think that it's time to move on to open mic, yes. Okay, okay, cool. Uh, so, all right, we have about 17 minutes, which I think is a good amount of time. So, um, uh, uh, let's see, so there's, um, uh, Andrew uh, already acknowledged kind of what's happening um, with the uh, Ukraine and Russia crisis. And uh, I think there's a couple of things that I'd like to say before we jump into the discussion. Firstly, uh, Kale, who's our uh, expert at kind of moderating community discussions, uh, will be uh, moderating this one as well. Um, so Kale, thank you for that. Um, uh, we've gotten a few emails from people in the community who have asked, uh, and also people from elsewhere who have asked if Sikka is going to put uh, forth a statement about the crisis. Um, so that is um, uh, something that we have been talking about within the EC, we've been discussing. Uh, and there is also other perspectives brought up. For instance, there are um, no concerns around how it looks when we support people suffering on account of one crisis as opposed to others. And that's a very real um, concern that, that we have been discussing quite actively. And um, uh, I don't think that it would be fair to say um, at all that, uh, that, that uh, there aren't other conflicts that deserve more attention. And even within Sikai, um, uh, um, whether or not we have people in these communities, um, uh, it's, uh, it's something that we need to be mindful of. Now, um, with regards to putting out statements, that's something that we have to work with the ACM on. Um, uh, and so that's also a conversation that we're having. And uh, finally, I think when it comes to supporting the community and trying to figure out how we might support the community. That's the conversation that we have here with you all and with others. So um, that's the piece that we want to do now here. Uh, and if you have questions, if you have concerns, if you have suggestions, um, we're here to take them and to think about how we move forward and not just in terms of putting forth um, words, but also thinking carefully about actions that we might think about, given that there is, uh, uh, there is conflict that we uh, need to be thinking about carefully now, but also will be in the future, things that we have been seeing, things that we haven't seen. And the question is really whether or not uh, Sikai as a computing or as an HCI community needs to be engaging with them and on them or not. So um, that said, I'd like to um, hand it over first to Kale. So Kale, if you want to say anything first, um, go ahead and then we can open it up. Yeah, thank you, Neha. Um, yeah, so just to stress a couple tiny more points um, and then I can take your question, Patrick. Uh, it's important to note that you know, we, as an EC, uh, are all also individually situated in our own ways of sort of processing this, in our own, like, coming to different understandings. In the conversations more recently, we have been a lot more aligned than not. And I think one of the things every single person on the committee has agreed to is that, you know, much more than a statement, we need those ways of supporting tangibly in concrete ways ongoing and, you know, in a, yeah, in ways of reconciliation. So backward flipping as well. Um, if we can stay mostly focused on those more concrete ways to support uh, not only SIGCHI members um, and this community, but the adjacent and ever expanding communities that are affected by the sort of research and technology and human computer interaction that we do, that'd be fantastic. Um, but yeah, Patrick, if you'd like to start us off. Shall I go, Kel? There we go. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. So I guess um, 
purely my own personal view. I don't, I don't think it is the place of CKI or ACM to make statements about the rights and wrongs of particular wars and conflicts, other than that obviously we, you know, we're not in favor of any at all, yeah. Um, but I do think things like professional bodies, certainly when we think of academia, plays an important role continuously about being a place where we support exchange of ideas between people, regardless of the conflicts and the context in which they live. So my, my concern is more, if we're thinking about Sikai more generally, is about scholars who are at risk, yeah. Now, obviously, scholars in conflict zones and in that are top, wrapped up in conflicts in, in are at risk in different ways. Um, and so that's a, a clear focus. But you know, you've only got to look at Myanmar, Hong Kong, all sorts of areas, all sorts of areas. You know, some would argue even in US and European universities, if you hold particular views on politics or whatever, that you're you're at risk. So I think my my preferences that we focus on scholars and I guess because we're professional body practitioners at risk and and how we can support how we can support them yeah thank you I think I think that is very central I think there's large questions about how to we're the most effective um, and valuable line to sort of ride between being hard on systems, soft on people, understanding that there are a lot of ways like mining, uh, if I'm gonna speak locally, every single one of us is on a computer and that has had devastating effects on First Nations peoples here. I mean, there are so many ways that these things can ripple out. Um, we're not just concerned necessarily with our direct community, though that is something that we are immensely responsible to. Um, I think we also engage in research that has those direct effects on other communities outside of Sikai, and that's something we don't want to lose sight of as well. But if we can at least start somewhere tangible, um, Neha had asked in the comments, what are some ways in which you can support them, Patrick? So one way of, when we're thinking of scholars at risk is obviously giving visibility to academics. Now, obviously for some people who are in those contexts, that can be dangerous in itself, but it can also be valuable because people see that these people are visible internationally and, and, and people are looking out to what's happening to them. But obviously there's a lot of exiled academics. I mean, there is Scholars at Risk program in the US where you look to promote refugee academics who are refugees or from a bunch of these companies, they might be academics, but they don't have PhD places. So we advocate for them to be recruited by universities. I'm not sure that's a very scalable thing, but I think certainly a talk series maybe run by Sikai around sort of scholars at risk where we give visibility to people talking about the challenges in these countries. So I think it's a advocacy for the sort of intellectual freedom that, that we aspire to. I think that's something we can do. I would have thought maybe I'm not, I'm thought about it a lot, to be honest. Yeah, thank you. Um, are there other thoughts, comments, suggestions, maybe considerations from anyone else in the room? Marilyn, did you have your microphone on or wish to speak? All right. Okay, um, we have talked uh, about, you know, different ways that we can lend visibility to certain scholars, certain types of scholarships, um, scholarship. <laughs> we've talked about scholarships a little bit. Um, we've talked about, yeah, internal cultures within Sig Kai. Um, we have been really grateful and thankful for this sort of shift that we've been able to take due to you know you see composition here where we can't sort of hide behind um <laughs> without saying too much just sort of like stances of a politicality of actions research and knowledge work um 
So we're looking at what long-term that can mean um, and how that translates into action. Can I say something else? Sorry, as no one else is sorry, at the moment. So I was going to say, you know, often the mechanism, so something we do, and that's local, if you're thinking in, in Melbourne, is engaging with diaspora communities from these affected regions. So, for example, um, we have a programme at Monash um, around um, a number of um, Afghan women, around um, that, are, uh, that are refugees and thinking about bridge, trying to bridge them, uh, bridge programmes where they sort of enter university and advocate about the conditions of ac uh, academics there. And also the local Myanmar community is more specialist in that sort of the Karen community here as well. So I think we can talk about Sikai doing it, but it's almost like you'd want a sort of template for how to pe how people might do that if people were interested in doing that. Of course, a lot of people are doing that anyway in university. So maybe it's about HCI academics engaging with, often it's the sort of you know, arts and humanities academics who are doing, who are engaged in these programs anyway. Um, and I guess we can provide resources or visibility. I don't know, you know, I'm just, I'm trying, I guess maybe it's back to the original point, which is like, what value is a statement compared to, you know, and, and yes, Ukraine has brought it into people's mind, but we know there's some sort of horrendous conflicts going on all over the place. And what can we do, you know? Absolutely, yeah. There have been, and this is, you know, for the, for this to be brought up um, by Ukraine, it makes sense. Cultures need to shift. Our culture needs to shift around things like this. And it's happening at the time that it's happening due to, yeah, aspects of implicit racism, culturism, um, a lot of the sort of systems and structures of oppression that we're born in and raised in and have been normalized. And so I think, yeah, as you're saying, and as Susan is sort of echoing here, best practices and templates to help people do tangible projects locally. I think as an EC, we've been trying to focus actually a lot on how we can increase the sort of power of local organizations, local communities, as well as um, being able to provide, you know, the material conditions for making that community sort of sustainable, at least within like HCI and SIGCHI. Um, I see Ben, you have your hand up. Thank you. Uh, I'm very pleased to see this group uh, carrying on the great traditions of SIGCHI and uh, and dealing and wrestling with difficult issues. Uh, uh, so bravo, just nice to see many of these, many of you as new faces and some familiar ones. I, I did want to just suggest there are two, I, I want to compliment about the, the directions about sustainability and the, and the desire to involve in some way with the Ukrainian situation. Uh, the sustainability is an important topic. Uh, you might want to connect with uh, Frank Bentley, who's trying to move the AAAI to deal with climate change as well. Uh, I just got a note from him today, and he's retired from IBM, but he's leading an effort with AAAI that you may want to coordinate. As for Ukraine, it's a difficult issue, and I would just suggest the precedents you might follow are you may know that you know 30 or 40 years ago Jack Minker led a ACM effort, a major ACM effort um, that was about the human rights of computer scientists, particularly in the Soviet Union, that were being violated. And so uh, that was a focus uh, of, of you know on, on computer scientists. But Sikai, if you if you have identified Ukrainian uh, members of um, SIGCHI, that's the focus you might speak up on and uh, try to speak up for their safety, protection, and their, and their rights. A second approach is to deal with it on the technical side, which is that the misinformation of social media and the way in which the technologies that the SIGCHI community is rightfully proud of contributing to have also have been used for inappropriate purposes. And so I think that's a that's a difficult statement to make, but you can do it by saying Sig Kai was responsible for a lot of these technologies 
and now we're troubled to see that they've put, been put to work. We believe that the social media platforms have a strong responsibility to fight this in much more severe ways. They have not been doing sufficiently uh, in stopping misinformation and, uh, and, and spreading of lies and conspiracies that have really damaged a lot of people. So those are the two paths I suggest if you can identify Ukrainian members of SIGCHI, or if you can speak up about issues for which SIGCHI has clearly credibility and importance. And that may motivate more of SIGCHI members to be involved in these issues. Thank you, and bravo for all of you for the energy you're putting into SIGCHI. And I'm astonished I wrote to a couple of you separately of a $7.9 million budget. Uh, that's unbelievable to me, but it's wonderful. And, you know, it's a big, it's a big show. So uh, carry it forward. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Personally, I feel it is so important to look backwards as we look forward. So that's, that's not actually an area that I've looked into. Um, I'm really curious about what happened during, yeah, for Jack Maker and what happened after, sorry. Yeah, it was Jack Maker, correct? Okay, perfect. Yes. Um, and I mean, there should be lots of information. He wrote a whole book about the effort, but it was a, it was a major effort of ACM, not just a, a group, but uh, and there were many pages published, you know, dozens of pages in the CACM listing the names of individual computer scientists whose rights were being violated, mainly in the Soviet Union, but in many other places. Yeah. So One thing, perfect. sorry to jump in, Kale. I just wanted to say that's super helpful and that's something I'll follow up with ACM on. And also that, um, one note that I did get back from Vicky Hansen, who's the CEO of ACM, was that the Technology Policy Council is the, the body within the ACM that looks into uh, these matters. So I'm hoping that they've also been paying attention and have something planned. But I'll follow up. Anything else? We're at time now. Um, so maybe well, we while I'm on here, up. I guess uh, I've spoken with some of you about the idea of HCI history. And as some of you may know, I have donated money to the Charles Babbage Institute, which will launch an award for um, HCI history writing. Um, there'll be two awards, one for a master's PhD and the other for books, videos, or websites. And we are asking Miha and others in the leadership to support this effort, uh, recognize it, and um, we offer even, there is a board, there will be a judging panel, there has been a, Jeffrey Yost of CBI has assembled a panel. We hope Sig Kai will contribute one person to that panel. Um, and that we can announce the that this award is happening at SIGCHI 2022. The deadline will be late in 2022, and we hope that the first award winners can be announced at CHI 2023. So I hope some attention can be given to it. And uh, Niha, I know you have many demands, but I hope you would respond to Jeffrey Yost and offer the as much support as you can. We're not asking for money. We're not asking for anything else, just that you align with it and be listed as a partner. Uh, Sikai mm -hmm. history is, I think, an important story to tell in order to make our future secure and so and to inspire others for that direction. So absolutely. Yeah. No, thank you for doing that and for um connecting us. And yeah, there's no question about it. We've already said we've, we've committed and um, Susan also knows as AC partnerships, so we're doing it. Um, we still need to contribute that one person and, and we're in the process of, of uh, uh, selecting that person. So we'll get back to right. that. I hope that can happen soon because we'd like to get the announcement out going. Um, if you can't, if you don't have someone, that's okay. This award will go on, but SIGCHI can still be listed as a partner in the award. It's that simple. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. think we've aligned with SIGCHI values and a good way of making it global, international, diverse, and so on. You'll, you'll like the committee of people that are 
on this on this uh, award panel. They're really a very interesting, diverse set of people. And then none of them are SIGCHI researchers. They are all you know, historians or writers about this history. We're trying to move beyond us telling our own story and having, you know, having the story be written by people, you know, beyond our discipline that can make a credible uh, critique of what we've done. Thank you for doing this, Ben. And yeah, don't don't worry about us following up. We'll, uh, I will send an email soon. Um, I think Josh uh, has been on this because we've also been finalizing the members of the awards committee on our end because um, the awards review is going on yes, now. Yes, that is correct. So, yeah. Hey, Ben, thank, thank you, you so much for sharing that information. We are really excited to work with you on this and we have a big list of people. We have a big list of people to propose. Okay, so we're four minutes over, which means we should probably um, call it a night or a day or whatever you are. Thank you all for joining. We will share details about the budget in a SIGPI member's email soon and also on a blog post. Uh, but thank you for joining us today. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye bye. Cool, it's just us. I didn't hang up this time. Oops, I need to stop. <laughs> <laughs>